Hello, I'm Phil Wickens. Welcome to another episode of Delve In for 12 Min, part of a series of short online CPD sessions on the primary computing curriculum aimed at you, the class teacher, to give you ideas, resources and stuff you can take straight back to the classroom and deliver to your pupils. In this episode, we're going to look at variables. Variables appear in the national curriculum in the key stage two section, where it talks about pupils using sequence, selection and repetition, working with variables and various forms of inputs and outputs. So it's there in black and white. But what does it mean? How do we use it? And how do we teach it? We could start off by asking the children to explore the etymology of the word variable. Where does it come from? What does it mean? You might get a few of them saying, well, it sounds a bit like to vary something when something varies. What does that mean? They might recognise, oh, the temperature varies or the speed of my car on the way to school varies. And you can explain, yes, that is a variable, something that changes. Now, temperature and speed, you could go into a bit more detail and say they are great examples of continuous variables on a range of numbers, on a scale. But you can have discrete variables too. For example, a name or my favourite ice cream flavour. When we teach children about computers and how computers work, we use the input, storage, process and output model. Variables will be stored in the memory, in the hardware of the computer and called upon by the processor when needed. But how do we teach variables to our class? Let's look at different ways to introduce this concept. There's a couple of different ways that I'm quite fond of to demonstrate that variables have a name and a value. However, they can only hold one value at a time. And whenever the name of that variable is called, it will produce whatever value it is holding. Let's look at the box analogy first. Da ding! Here is a box. And let's say this is a variable called favourite fruit. It has the name written right there. And here is my favourite fruit, a banana, the happy fruit. Now I'm going to assign this value to this variable by putting the value in the box. Now whenever I call favourite fruit, the value it will give me is banana. The only problem with the box analogy is that some children might think, well, you could put other things in that box as well. What if I also like apples or oranges? But we know that there can only be one value in a variable. Another way of looking at it, which I think I prefer, is on a whiteboard. Now this whiteboard, I've given the name of the variable score. And at the start of a quiz, my score would be zero. Now as you can see, I can only have one value. So if I get the first question correct, I can't have a zero and a one. I would rub out the zero and replace it with a one. So if you were going to use the box analogy, if your favourite fruit changed, or if you asked someone else what their favourite fruit was, you'd have to make sure you took one value out before putting another one in. Because a variable has a name and one value. Now as we talked about before, that value could be continuous, it could be a number that you can add and subtract to, or it could be discrete, it could be a bit of text. A really fun way to introduce this further to the class would be to ask them to write down some words and numbers. You will give them the name of the variable and they have to assign the value. For example, I could give my class the variable friend's name. They would all have to write 
friend's name and next to it a value for that. So they might write their best mate's name. I could then give them the variable number and they would have to write that name down, number, and then assign a value to it, any number they like, 875. I would then give them a variable colour and they might write pink. And I'd give them a variable favourite food and they might write bananas. Each child would have the same variables, but hopefully different values. You could then set up a funny sentence on the display saying, I went to dinner with friend's name last week. We ate number, colour, favourite food. For that child who wrote those values down, the sentence would read like this. I went for dinner with Jeff last week. We ate 875 pink bananas. Now, as you can see, that could be quite amusing to some peoples, especially me. But it then shows them that each person could have a different set of values for the same variables and the sentence would vary, would change depending on whose, whose uh, values we used. But they could only have one value at a time displayed in the sentence. You could then ask them, well, what other kind of variables are displayed in the classroom that we use day to day? The children might say the date. The date changes every day. That is a variable. You might have something that says the temperature today is 21 degrees. I wish. That would be a variable that would change daily. Or you could say, well, does it have to change daily? Could we check it more regularly and see if it changes throughout the day? How often would we check it? How often does it change? You could kind of go into a sciencey, mathsy route with that and explore that a little bit further with that kind of variable. Okay, so what does it look like in code? When we go to program and start to use the computer to write our own projects and code, then what does it look like? We're going to have a look at what variables look like in Scratch. Now in Scratch 1 and 2, the variables were hidden in the data category, whereas in Scratch 3, they've actually called it variables. Makes things a little bit easier. There are a range of system-defined variables within Scratch. This sprite, as it moves around, the X and the Y coordinate will change. That means we could use those system-defined variables, the X coordinate and the Y coordinate, to make the sprite do different things. If we wanted to make it look like the sprite was getting further away, then we could say as the Y value increases, then decrease the size of the sprite. Size of the sprite being another system-defined variable. Now let's look at user-defined variables. That's where we, the programmer, can create our own variables. And as you can see, the first question that Scratch asks us when we create our own variable is, would you like it for this sprite only or for all sprites? This is essentially asking whether we want our variable to be local or global. If it's specific to this sprite, like a number of lives that it has, then we can say, let's keep it to this sprite only. However, if that variable will trigger off other things within our project, like a change of background, or it will affect other sprites need to access that variable, then we need to make it global for all sprites to be able to access. The easiest variable that springs to mind when we look at Scratch is the question and answer. So the ask block, which is in the sensing section. Now this is using a variable, However, you can only set it by using the ask input. And this allows someone who's playing the game or uh, experiencing the project to be able to put information in for it to be used as a variable. Let's look at some ways that we could use that type of variable. 
we could personalize the project. So at the start of it, the user asks what their name is. And then throughout the project, we can keep referencing their name by using the answer block and making it feel like the computer is talking specifically to them. Let's have a look at some other user-defined variables that we can create as part of projects. How about a score? As you go through a quiz, if you get an answer correct, it can change your variable score by one, essentially adding one to your score. If you get an answer incorrect, you could be mean and take one away from the variable, thus decreasing the score. You could also assign a variable to the speed of a character and a sprite. Let's have a look at this example where a car is racing around a track. The speed variable determines the speed of the car and as you can see as the car drives over a certain terrain which is a different colour we can say if touching this colour then set the speed to something uh, less than its original and therefore we can give the illusion that the car is slowing down because it's going over the grass and when it comes off the grass the speed variable, well, it's not touching the grass anymore, so it will revert back to its original state. You could have a variable that counts the laps every time a sprite goes around something. You could have a variable assigned to the amount of lives that a sprite has, and therefore they only have a certain amount of lives to complete a certain mission. One of the most important things that we need to do with variables when we're working in projects like this, is to initialize them. Now to initialize means right at the start, before anything else has happened, we will assign our variables a certain value. If we're starting a quiz, we'd like to assign our score variable with a zero. If we're racing around a track and we're just about to set off, we'd probably want to set our speed variable to three so that when it hits the grass, it can go down to two. Really good practice is to say to pupils, let's have a separate chunk of code over here which will do all of our initialization. That will be setting our variables, setting the location of our sprites, whether they're on show or whether they're on hide, setting our background to what it should be, and that way we can make sure that everything is as it needs to be before the user starts to engage in whatever the project is. I would expect to see variables in the design stage before children would go to code and start programming. I would expect to see in their algorithms, in their plans, which parts of their project will include variables and how those variables will work and change and what those variables need to be initialized as at the start of the project. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say design or plan or algorithm before the children start coding, then head back to one of my other Delve In for 12 Mins on design and it will tell you all about it. Here's a really interesting tip on how to use variables within the Scratch gaming window. Did you know that you can turn on and off your variable being shown here by ticking the checkbox in the variables column category. You can also right click on the variable in the gaming window and change it to just be a large number rather than the variable name as well. This could be quite helpful in various different aspects. You could have a little bit at the bottom that says your score is and then just the number showing up as like a counter as you go through the quiz. But here's the really exciting one. You can also right click it and change it to a slider. This allows the user to slide uh, up and down a continuous bar, thus changing the value of that variable. Now imagine the implications of being able to do that inside a game or an animation. Have a look at some of these examples and see which really get you going.
So that's all from me for this episode. Please get in touch and tell me how you're doing teaching variables and what kind of things your pupils have come up with. Until next time, bye for now.